you, ladies and gentlemen. There's 75 people connected to this meeting already. I couldn't see everyone on the screen. I can see that uh, Anastasia Shumudiadi is with us, so everyone is here. So if everyone is agreeable, let's get started. Let's start this, this session. Uh, so greetings to all of you, warm welcome, M colleagues, members of ICOM France, ICOM International. There's a lot of you here. Thank you for being with us. For this uh, third session of our second cycle about solidarity, which we started in last December, uh, this is a session that's open to all ICOM members. And the idea is we want to dialogue between uh, museum professional in this very unusual period that we're walking through. As you may know, this follows on from a first cycle of uh, discussions that started during the first lockdown in May to create uh, connections between people in ICOM France and all members, whatever their position in their establishment or wherever their museum is at within the landscape uh, of, around the country. So we had the impression people enjoyed the first cycle, and that's why we decided this autumn to carry on and carry on doing these uh, discussions until September of this year. Since then, uh, the pandemic has not uh, come to a halt, but it's carried on and museums haven't reopened. Museums all around the world are confronted with COVID. Not all countries are organised in the same way. Some countries have their museums open, some, and some museums have remained closed. The thing that I'd like to highlight is that we are or we should be uh, in solidarity with one another. Each of us is w walking through different situations, but we all know that the museum of the future, museums after this crisis, after this long closure of our museums, unfortunately, some probably will not open because they'll have lost so much income. We uh, know that we will have to think together about the museums of the future. ICOM, our international organisation, has, right from the start of this crisis, been a very key stakeholder in developing this relationship between museums around the world. ICOM opened a call for projects entitled Solidarity, encouraging national committees like ours and international committees to commit to common shared actions. And that's what we're doing here today with this second cycle of discussions. We've put it together in cooperation with international partners. ICOM in Finland, partners who are undoubtedly here, ICOM Israel, ICOM Greece, and the International Committee of Scientific and Technical Museums. I'm delighted to announce today that we have found out just very recently that our project was selected by ICOM International, that it is supported and promoted uh, by our NGOs. This is a very important thing. That's the first time I'm aware that ICOM France has received such support through a call for projects uh, by ICOM, ICOM International. So for the last few months, we've been informing you increasingly of our international activities. We're very aware of what's going on, the work on the definition of museums, the code of ethics, everything that's going on within our organization, because we think that the unity of our organization is a very important issue. Every time we meet, I say this, there are 50,000 members in our organization representing nearly 140 countries of the world. It's an organization which has been very uh, lively and uh, carrying out a lot of important work since the last, for the last 70 years. We feel it's important that the world benefits from this work. So for this reason, I want to thank you warmly and sincerely. I want to thank our international colleagues with Anastasia Kontramuzia from Greece. I want to uh, also uh, greet Teki, our president of ICOM Greece. We've got Sherki Dagmeli, who is from the International Committee of Scientific and Technical Museums, president of this, and he's very also president of the uh, Telecoms Museum in Rabat in Morocco. I want to greet all of our international partners who are connected. As you know, since uh, December, our sessions have been translated into different languages to enable this intercultural dialogue. 
I really want to welcome uh, very warmly Paul Salmona, uh, the director of the uh, Museum of the Art and History of Judaism. We've got Pierre-Yves Lechamp here, uh, who's from CLIC. Also, uh, Estelle Guy de Butte, who is uh, from the... Uh, who is our dear colleague, a member of the Committee of Icon France, and she is a chief curator of heritage, and she is going to moderate our session. Uh, I'm going to hand over to her. I forgot to mention Bridget Yeboeuf, advisor for museums in the Auvergne Rhône Alpes region. So over to you, Estelle, Estelle Guy de Butte. Thank you very much, uh, Juliette, for this introductory, uh, these introductory comments. I hope you can hear me well. I just wanted to remind you of one very important practical thing. We are delighted to have uh, interpreters working with us today. So please uh, look for the little icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's a globe symbol and uh, interpretation button. So listen in to the language uh, that you want to hear and that you are going to speak in, please. So the subject that we're looking at uh, around the theme of solidarities is digital technology or digital technologies. Obviously, as we would all agree, museums have not waited for the COVID pandemic to use digital technology to communicate with their audiences. Nonetheless, COVID some seems to have sped things up and most museums around the world have really grasped the opportunity offered by digital tools in order to maintain relationships with their visitors and to continue to exist simply, to be present and useful. In the context of this worldwide pandemic, the question that we needed to raise, do you find that digital is synonymous with solidarity between professionals on the one hand? Uh, we are mostly professionals here and the relationships between professionals and citizens and with the public audience it is often said that a museum that is less visited is also a museum whose website is less visited. But we're also seeing museums being very present on social media. The Minister of the Culture in France has launched an initiative called Culture at Home, which is a government platform. So uh, this Tuesday, you'll be able to visit behind the scenes of the National uh, Furniture Museum. Communication, cultural mediation, there are a number of key questions to be asked. What is a digital strategy? Is it possible to implement one? New digital technology is starting to leave the technical field and become a strategy in and of itself. What audiences should we aim for? Can we reach out to all, uh, all audiences? What about people with disabilities? Beyond our 360 degree visits, as they're often known. What other digital offerings can mediums put in place and how? But there are also some new questions that are raised. What changes have been observed in terms of offerings and tools that can be used? What unprecedented experiments have you observed and spotted that you might be able to share with us? Should we offer these things for free or should we charge for them? Maybe a bit of both. How can we train people to use digital technologies? Who should be responsible within the museum team? Because staff teams are very different from one museum to another. Obviously, uh, during this debate, you might want to raise other issues. We don't really have very many statistics uh, this time, but we are seeing that our museums online are reaching more young people. So. We, I'm sure that our speaker today will be able to give us a high quality feedback about what they've observed in terms of interactions with different audiences. So with Juliette Raoul Duval, I want to suggest this order of intervention. We're going to hear first of all from Mr. Damali, who's already been introduced. He's the president of the Simusette, uh, but he's also director of the Maroc Telecom Museum. 
Following on from him, we're going to hear from Pierre-Yves Luchon, Associate Director of Synapse Conseil and uh, uh, Director of Click France. A third uh, speaker will be Brigitte Liebeuf, who is an advisor for museums, uh, who is based in Clermont-Ferrand in France, uh, in the Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes region. Then we'll hear from Paul Salmona, director of the Museum of Art of History of Judaism in Paris. And then we'll hear from Anastasia Chouamouadi, uh, associate professor of museology in the Department of Cultural Technology and Communication at the University of the Aegean in Greece. Each of you will have around six or seven minutes to, to speak to us. And we will uh, leave Mrs. Shomoti to uh, give us the last words with a more international perspective, perhaps a more personal perspective from Greece as well. People who have already been part of these debates just already know that the idea is not to have a top-down approach uh, to these talks, but to be able to uh, discuss between one another. That's what, one of the great strengths of these debates. So we will allow opportunities to our listeners to ask questions or give some personal testimonies. So thank you to all of you for being with us today. First of all, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Uh, Damali, with his international perspective. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. Indeed, uh, Simuse didn't hesitate for a single uh, instant when we were invited to take part in this, this program. And we saw that this program is really comes in a critical time, especially because of the pandemic, and we need to have solidarity between us, especially because we've started to feel that there's a lack of public support, public and private support for museums for the moment. According to the most recent statistics in the Arab region, we have about 24 um, of, of small private museums will, uh, will, will close. Uh, definitively. We need to have solidarity between us, between colleagues, between large museums and small museums. This is really important. To talk about the the team, the theme today of the solidarity of digital, digital technologies, in order to open up this discussion about the relationship between museums and digital technologies, we could have collections online, we could have uh, online events, um, which could be part of, um, sort of activities or private tours. We can have also newsletters. We can have digital copies of newsletters. And we also, of course, have social media and websites. These are the different tools that museums are using to stay in contact with their audiences. But are all audiences in the world are all museums in the world able to use these tools in the right way? And have they allocated budgets for this? According to the, the most recent report from ICOM, I always take the example of regions that are perhaps less favored. For example, in the African continent, only 40% of museums reserve allocate 1% of their budgets for for digital technologies, um, so, sorry, 80%. So, so more, more, more than 20% don't have the right tools uh, for digital technologies. So there's a very significant problem here. We have staff who, who are what we would call digital immigrants. Most museum staff are not digital natives. That means they have immigrated into digital technologies, and so they're not perhaps uh, able to, to properly adapt to digital uh, technologies in order to, to manage these tools. And you can see this in terms of uh, communications, uh, the way they communicate with their audiences. Another question is 
do we need uh, digital technologies in some countries in order to um, publicize museums or or in order to produce an inventory of our collections because for example we have uh, some colleagues who said who say we don't need digital, techno digital technologies for communication for publicity but they're asking for help uh, to uh, digi digitalize their their inventory uh, lists the, the capital of museums are their collections so if we can keep these collections in a digital tool um, that stops us from from losing documents that are currently in a paper format so if we come back to this theme of today to conclude if we ask the question about whether digital technologies are uh, express solidarity with one another well there's uh, there's two aspects to this. First, there's the aspect of of content being free for audiences, and perhaps this 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 might have been uh, for payment before. There are now big museums that are offering virtual virtual tours, and we're 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 enjoying this. Um, whereas before, we had to pay for some of these collections. But in terms of the distribution of this tool around the world, I don't think digital te technologies are, are fairly distributed because a number of museums have other priorities which are connected more to management of collections uh, rather than using digital, te digital technologies for communicating with visitors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for what you said and also for respecting the time limit. So without more adieu, ado, I'll pass over to Pierre-Yves Lauchon, who might be able to talk to us about what's happening in terms of digital technology in uh, museums. Good afternoon. Thank you, Juliette, for your invitation to be with you this afternoon. Uh, one of the among the questions uh, that's been presented here, I, 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 I've kind of selected just some of them, and I want to start with an idea that's really important to me, but is not clear to everybody yet. And this is the question of digital strategy. A digital strategy only really has meaning if there's an overall strategy of, of the institution in terms of uh, winning back audiences, expanding brand or uh, economic development or generating resources. So I think that digital technologies can only be a tool which serve these different strategies. But obviously, it's an, esson an essential and increasingly essential tool. I'm just going to compare two statistics. Now, 78% of French people connect to the internet every day, and 76% are active users of social media. If I co compare this with another figure, which is more relevant to you, and the proportion of visitors who visited a museum or exhibition in 2018 is 2.9%, and that's dropped from 1997 by 11 points. So we see 78% of French people are connected, but 29%, under 30%, are, are, are visit museums. So obviously, where museums are, are, are reach a, de, a determined uh, a determined target. Of course, digital technologies are going to help us to reach younger targets or maybe people abroad. And for this, digital technologies is going, are going to help us a lot. Between up, up to 2013, the people visiting museums has dropped by 10 points. So you need to imagine, for example, uh, mediation approaches that are adapted to these different audiences that we are struggling to bring into our museums. We can see, for example, the TikTok, the success of TikTok around the world linked into museums. This is helping with targeted audiences. COVID-19 has obviously generated a lot of experiments. I haven't got the time 
to present or present or detail all of them, but these lockdowns have have developed new trends in terms of tools and digital services, which I'm going to just summarize in five detail five headings. Do it yourself first of all, in terms of content gen generating your own com content. And this leads to a kind of popularization and an access to digital uh, data for museums that have less resources or less human resources, less budgetary resources, therefore smaller resources, who, because of the ease of producing videos, have been able to use digital technologies much more significantly during, during these lockdowns. The second aspect is the desanctification the desacralization of these tools. We have, we have all kinds of people uh, speaking on on, web, on museum websites. People that we might not expect. This means that there's a, a desacralization of uh, of messages, which is leading to more, a more subjective approach and a more accessible approach. Third is that we have a more of a focus on events, um, with kind of live uh, events online press tours and also general tours. Fourthly, we have an increased number of uh, visitors through and participation through gathering objects. And fifth, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, all the physical aspects are happening online, whether it's the boutique, souvenir boutiques, and of course, school visits. And all of these phenomena the crisis has acted as an accelerator, but I'm convinced that the rapid transformation uh, of behavior for museums, I, I think that's going to stay. I think it's something that's going to remain. In, among the questions that Estelle asked was the question of monetization. In terms of monetization, this is a question that keeps com coming back in discussions between professionals and in experiments. I think it leads us to three questions. To what extent is it acceptable by the public? To, to, uh, how is it compatible with the missions of the museums? And what is the added value? When we can see the experiments that have been developed in terms of monetization of digital activities, we can see that this marketing of a digital activity is only accepted when there is human me mediation and uh, interact interactiveness and when it's justified by the added value. So, for example, there was uh, online um, online lessons with the Victorian Albert Museum, also with the Arc City of Architecture and various other American institutions. But however, we can see the semi-failure or the, the bad image, image uh, of other practices, for example, uh, exhibition tours without any interaction, uh, which is not interactive, uh, 360 degree tours with restricted access to or restricted access to digital collections in some areas. To finish, I'd just like to pick up the, the question at the beginning of the title of this. Is it solidar is it solid do we see solidarity in digital technologies? I'd say yes, definitely. Because this is forcing us, and we can see through the, the, the success of the ICOM web, webinar, this is something that encourages sharing and also encourages pooling. Um, the aspects that we've seen, uh, the different tools that have been launched, and we were able to organize with about 20 museums and science, cultural areas. We, we reached 2 million Facebook uh, members, and also with virtual exhibitions, we 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 for, saw 400,000 single visitors uh, in seven months. So we can see this as a, a solidarity between institutions and their audiences. For example, workshops uh, which are reaching people who are locked down, uh, who cannot come to museums but also where there is participatory funding to fund artists uh, or museums that are in danger or launch new activities, for example, mediation activities for, for families. 
So in a number of cases, digital technologies uh, brings together museum and solidarity. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony, Pierre-Yves. We'll come back to that later. So I'd like to now pass over to Brigitte Leabeuf, who could give us the example from the Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes region to give us, give us some feedback from what's happening on the ground in, in museums uh, as a, a museum advisor. Thank you, Brigitte. Thank you, uh, Estelle. Good afternoon, everybody. My talk uh, is going to uh, focus on letting some of my museum colleagues uh, give their point of view because we have two advisors for uh, museums and we're supporting 135 museums around France. As an introduction, before I talk about solidarity, um, I uh, obviously uh, am very uh, along the same lines as Mr. Damali. All museums are not equal uh, when it comes to digital technology. Across France, we have world, world renowned museums uh, which are supported by a major metropolis. But we also support small uh, local territorial museums that are supported by uh, small villages with only 200 uh, populations. So the budget, the human resources are not the same in these two different situations. So we can see that access to digital technology, uh, we have uh, in our region some areas with no museums at all. So. Uh, and, and with very poor internet connection. So we're struggling to even have video conferences with uh, some colleagues. So there's a real uh, inequality between different museums and different ways of using digital technology. So uh, I'll come back to that when I talk about how COVID has affected us. One specific point, which is perhaps typical to France, we have about 80% uh, of our museums that are uh, supported by municipal uh, councils, uh, town or city level uh, local authorities. And many of our colleagues reported to us that during uh, the first lockdown in particular, how difficult it was to, to implement even uh, the simplest uh, actions on social media because they are part of a local council and they don't have control over their social media uh, communication. Their website is hosted by the town council or the local council and communication is managed by a communications department, which is not uh, managed directly by the museum. It's an additional layer of bureaucracy, which means that the digital technology isn't so smooth and streamlined to roll, roll out. And that's has an impact in the way that they can reach out to their audience. Having said that, despite all of these uh, difficulties, I would agree with what uh, Mr. Luchon said, because uh, around the region, we have seen that there are some good examples, the most responsive examples tended to be those museums that were small or medium sized, not necessarily those who were able to draw up a digital strategy before the pandemic. But uh, as uh, Pierre Luchon said, they use this do-it-yourself approach. So we've seen individual uh, initiatives from the mediation staff who phoned themselves explaining a particular work from their museum. And they wanted to carry on their work of cultural mediation. And that's one of the things that has come out from this period, this uh, fact that perhaps some of the museums that didn't have a digital strategy, didn't have the means to put one in place, but have been able to put in place a social media strategy in this kind of DIY approach. In some ways, I regret uh, the fact that the Ministry of Culture hasn't communicated on these different uh, initiatives. When the a culture at home site was developed in France. Uh, unfortunately, the big, well editorial, editorial, well written uh, examples were, were foregrounded and highlighted, and we didn't see some of the smaller do it yourself examples. 
unfortunately, I, I, I've raised that with the Ministry of Culture. Uh, the types of tools that are used are things like Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. They were listed earlier on. We we see uh, digital uh, visits of uh, exhibitions that are no longer accessible. We saw that particularly during the first uh, lockdown. Uh, there were a lot of initiatives when children at home with their parents being homeschooled to uh, organize, for example, art workshops or, or science-focused workshops for kids and families. One of the things that happened a bit differently was the uh, fact that the museums wanted to show the public behind the scenes, uh, uh, show their collections quite a bit uh, on Instagram about how an ex exhibition is put together, how it's uh, taken down again, uh, content about the restoration of museum objects, museums that didn't perhaps communicate a lot about its acquisitions policy, but small museums that highlighted its most their most recent acquisitions. So there's a real desire to highlight the way a museum works behind the scenes to show that despite the fact that they were closed, that the teams were still there, still working, and were still wanting to communicate with their audience. One of the things that I've found a bit unusual is a new way of communicating with the public. Uh, pub people are reaching out to visitors through games and challenges and competitions. There's, there's a little bit more humor as well in the way that works are being interpreted. Some, some new approaches, different approaches to what you might find on a typical institutional website. So those are perhaps some of the conclusions uh, about what I have seen on the ground. But if I go on to talk about solidarity and solidarity between professionals, what I have seen is that the use of video conferencing has has been a tool that people have have had to get used to. And we've got an informal network of cultural mediators that tended to get together every year around uh, a theme. Uh, and it included a number of young uh, explainers and mediators. And I was fairly surprised about the questions they had about whether they would be able to carry on their discussions uh, remotely using digital technology. We had some feedback from them because we held some remote participatory workshops, uh, particularly on uh, audience and public uh, policies. And one of the conclusions of these uh, workshops was that, yes, we can still communicate and share share experience and show solidarity to one, one, one another using video conferencing. That was something that wasn't necessarily part of their current practices. Perhaps a final uh, observation, and this is uh, based on who we are, the uh, regional uh, directorate for cultural affairs. We're thinking about our position and how to support uh, these initiatives, which are initiatives linked to the work of discussion and exchange with the public remotely, either using off-site uh, approaches or support for the use of digital technologies, perhaps uh, support for smaller mediums that don't have the means and resources to use the technology themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brigitte, for those examples uh, from Auvergne and from your region. We're now going to head to Paris and hear from Paul Salmoner from the Museum of the Art and History of Judaism, who was already very active before the COVID crisis in terms of presence on digital networks. So over to you, Paul Salmoner. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. I think what we can say in in general, of course, I'm just talking about our museum, which is just a, a medium a medium to small um, museum. We have about 30, a staff of about 30 people in terms of scientists, but of course there is also uh, guards, security guards in addition to that. The first lockdown was a real uh, 
kick and kick, kicked us off in terms of the use of digital technologies. Um, in, we've been able to put a, a lot of the documentation on, on, online. About uh, 30,000 items are online. But, but then uh, we, with the lockdown, we immediately uh, wondered what we were going to do on the internet in, in, in general. And this was a very stimulating process. It w uh, enabled us to go deeper in terms of the knowledge that we had of uses. I'll come back to this in, in a bit more detail, but I think one of the one of the big advantages of this was that it brought the whole cultural and scientific team together, who had been obviously uh, split up and locked down at home, but it brought them together in terms of working on these tools together. So it was a had a psychological ad advantage for the psycho psychology of the team is very positive. It's helped us a great deal to improve everything that we're doing on the website to better promote these resources, of course. And here I'm answering directly your question in terms of solidarity. It was a very important way of maintaining uh, connection with our audiences. Uh, our museum has a, an important uh, local audiences. It's, it's not a, we don't have a permanent collections, but we have a number of temporary exhibitions, uh, six to eight a year. We have a 200-seater auditorium with uh, about 100 events a year. We have an educational department. We have a library. We have all these different centers outside the permanent collection that bring in audiences, uh, local audiences. So, of course, this uh, local connection uh, with our audiences has been substituted online replaced online and this has been really essential so what what can we say about this um we've talked about a whole series of newsletters we've got a, a weekly uh, newsletter we've had to review the way that we present our collections and and uh, redo our presentation uh, sheets on the key on the key pieces of the museum which we hadn't worked on for a number of years we've had to improve a whole number of functions around uh, on the on the on the, um, the 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 works database we've had to develop some different aspects of the mediation and explainer service for schools for families for children we've also offered uh, sessions online alternative sessions for for training with uh, real training sessions for for teachers and what, what else can we say I, I talked about the auditorium which has a very important role so we had to cancel a whole load of sessions uh, in terms of, of tours um, for schools and sessions in our auditorium but we were able to offer uh, a, a number of interesting uh, auditorium sessions which saw a really spectacular increase in our in audiences i don't know in terms of whether it's a social cultural expansion expansion but definitely in terms of a ge geographical reach we had uh, a dialogue with Dan, Daniel Mendelssohn, who, who is a, a, an excellent American writer who speaks French. And we had a discussion between Paris and New York, which brought in more than 600 connections. I think that behind each of those connections, there were, there were probably a number of people, which was the case for me, which is perhaps three times the number of people we can get in the auditorium and um, and six times the number we can get during a lockdown period because you can only get 100 people in the auditorium when we're allowed to. And what was interesting was that we had these spe spectators and these listeners in the regions abroad as well, which which backs up one of our ideas uh, for the future, which maybe connects into this idea of solidarity, which is, uh, and we're obviously thinking about the questions of charging and payment, because this is really a, a question that we don't have a lot of answers to. I was really interested in what Pierre-Yves Lauchon said about that. Um, but we're thinking about, in addition to what we already do, putting certain things on streaming, some, some of these events online, 
because that would give us a much bigger audience. I, I, I worked at the Louvre Auditorium for about 16 years, and one of the regrets I had was that uh, beyond the 400, 450 people that we could get in the auditorium, we 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 couldn't develop from 19. We, we weren't able to develop online um, um, broadcasting streaming with recordings that could have expanded our audiences. Uh, our our nas big national museums on, only reach local uh, local audiences, really, even the elite of our institutions. And uh, I think this is something uh, Im important to develop. I'm not going to go into it more than this because I think I've more or less already run out, already run out of time. Perhaps the the last thing is to say that something that we did online is that we had a, a public uh, subscription for 200 uh, sketches of Emil Zola's um, court case. And we, we acquired these sketches for about 15,000 euros at the end of the year. We, we discovered them in December. So we acquired them, but in, uh, with, with the, we didn't have the funds, but thanks to public support via online, we had over 50,000 uh, euros which were contributed uh, to help us acquire uh, these sketches which is powerful uh, evidence of the power of the internet. I've run out of time already, but we can talk further, of course, later on. Thank you very much, and well done for m mobilizing all these people for this acquisition. I think that's going to give ideas to a whole number of other participants today. After the four, four of you, I'm going to pass over now to Anastasia Shumuziadi, and I'm just going to also welcome our Greek friends who are, who are there, who are with us today around you, Anastasia, and are giving us a real European dimension today, to today's events. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Although our digital communication was rather problematic and I didn't receive uh, your directions, but I hope that showing you many images would make my presentation more amusing and I hope interesting. So I will need to share my screen, first of all, but you have disabled that. Can it be altered? We're just doing it. Um, sorry, it's taking a little bit of time, uh, but we're just setting it up. I think we're getting there now. It's just coming. Sorry about that. Okay. Are you able to screen share now? Yeah, it's okay. Do you see my screen now? Yes, it works. Okay. Well, Almost 10 months ago, my collaborators Anna Etni, Podina and me decided to record Greek Museum's response to the unprecedented phenomenon of COVID-19 pandemic. Last spring, both Greek society in general and Greek Museum people in particular thought that the lockdown caused by the pandemic was a shocking but brief event and reacted more or less spontaneously. Greek citizens proved against all odds quite obedient to the experts' guidance and were exemplary in adapting the new way of life. Alas, we cannot say the same for Greek museums. As our research showed, the majority of them were quite unable to use alternative, namely digital means, to keep running and communicating with their public. After a brief interval that offered us some interesting photographs, 
We are now living the third and most probably not the last lockdown. The World Health Organization is talking about pandemic fatigue and Greek citizens have realized that the hygienic situation, no matter how severe it is, cannot freeze our lives. After all, the pandemic has only magnified chronic problems of Greek society and Greek museums alike. Focusing on the latter, the Museology Lab of the Aegean University decided to extend the examination period, including the second phase of museum's closure as well. Our approach is stemming from the realization that when all this will be over, we cannot return to a cherished previous normality. So in our research, we do not focus on the exceptions imposed by the lockdowns, but on the rules that these exceptions have threatened. In other words, we believe that the pandemic is a unique opportunity to re-examine the museum's normality, not as victims of a force majeure, but as actors of change. Before expressing my thoughts, let me show you what occurred from our research. To form a representative image of Greek museums' cape, we were based on the official portal of the Greek Ministry of Culture and retrieved data concerning 271 institutions that are officially acknowledged as museums. The, thus, we built a general image and traced differentiations among museums as far as their digital activities are concerned during the two lockdowns. Since Odysseus portal offers minimal information and does not include multimedia and interactive content, we check the museum-run websites and proceed to further analysis concerning online activities and their nature. Announcements concerning the museum's closure, general announcements, online participatory events, educational programs, virtual tours, and multimedia content. The results are quite enlightening, though not surprising at all. The majority of Greek museums lack its own website. Therefore, museums present only in the Odysseus catalog were shut down in every sense during the lockdown. However, the existence of a website, although necessary, is not a sufficient condition for the development of online activities. Indeed, only half of those possessing a website took action, mainly informing the public about the mandatory closure along with other general announcements. Holiday wishes being the most popular theme. Apart from that, 16 museums provided multimedia content, nine educational programs, 10 offered a virtual tour, and two museums invited their visitors to live streaming too. Needless to say that we have to do with well-known museums with large audiences, rather stable revenues and funding, permanent staff and external collaborators with expertise in digital media. Most digital content pre-existed and only a few museums developed 10 new multimedia content during the quarantine. Online participatory events for museum audiences were almost non-existing. As an exception, the Thessaloniki Archaeological Museum organized two appealing and original open online actions in spring and another one in November. Moreover, during the second lockdown, some museums decided to realize their already programmed talks and discussions online so that the audience could attend and theoretically speaking participate. All in all, this kind of activities cannot be considered as an alternative to museum visits. Their role is to keep the audience warm until the end of the lockdown. Overall, the data we collected shows that Greek museums were unready to, for a digital turn. Even if technological affordances are available, ad hoc digital material is not easy to build up, especially under pressure. The digital for exhibition, for example, announced by the Jewish Museum is a mere presentation of images and certainly does not exploit the potential of digital technology in creating immersive environments, enhancing the content of the exhibits, 
offering a multifaceted interaction with them. And unfortunately, this is the case even if the digital exhibition constitutes an initiative of the Ministry of Culture itself. In other words, technical affordances are evolving disproportionately to the evolution of museums' theoretical and methodological frames concerning the digital tools. Interestingly enough, during the second lockdown, things changed for the worse instead of getting better. Something that, in my opinion, supports the hypothesis that Greek museums are anxious to return to their pre-pandemic way. And this way is based mainly on the following tenet. We cannot imagine museum practice without the physical interaction between artifacts and visitors. It proved easier to accept children attending a digital school, oldsters consulting a digital doctor, teenagers living a life after affair digitally, than accepting digital contact with museum collections. Why? Because almost 50 years after the first critical voices have been heard, Greek museums still believe that their strong point is the authentic physical object and its aura. Most Greek museums are content with that. A few, sp a few spend a lot on digital applications that are proudly presented to the media. Nevertheless, most digital additions in physical museum exhibitions are merely supporting the focal element, the object, either providing numerous information that visitors do not ask for or offering technical wonders to the public. In either case, the artifact remains physically and intellectually intact. On the other hand, physical visitors are necessary not only for their financial contribution, but also because their counting justifies the museum's existence. So far, most Greek museums have been reluctant to digitally share their collections. Therefore, during the pandemic, even if the already digitized collections were not, even the already digitized collections were not used. And when used, the digital product is in fact an online catalog. But let us for a moment move our focus from the self-contained artifact and its inherent significance to the potential multiple narratives in which this artifact can be entangled. Then, as 20 years ago Lev Manovich argued, the digital database can constitute the ideal starting point for numerous alternative open-ended narratives. In this vein of thought, the distancing from physical objects caused by the pandemic offers an advantageous situation that allows museums to explore digital narratives without the burden of material objects agency. In the familiar environment of their home, digital visitors can hopefully overcome the usual awe and become critical. They can turn their exclamation points into questions, thoughts, objections, even anger. Having said that, I do not claim that physical exhibitions or physical interaction with the collection is useless. What I'm trying to say is that by functioning for a while without them, we can discover what is missing from our suspended physical normality, active cultural artifacts and active audience. In other words, I believe that the awkward response of Greek museums to the pandemic situation will be bequeathed to the future as an awkward use of digital affordances. The recent digital upgrade of the Acropolis Museum is quite enlightening. 23 applications that exploit a limited spectrum of digital possibilities that show remarkable lack of content originality when they are not addressed to children, that cover a small part of the physical ex exhibition and, over, and offer to the digital visitors only a 360 tour and old school videos. In my opinion, we have to do at least with a problematic strategic plan. Thus, the problem, if we believe that there is actually a problem, won't be solved when Greek museums will obtain somehow the necessary substructure, financial means, and digitally informed personnel. It will be faced when we will start thinking differently. Perhaps the digital is the vaccine for Greek museum suffering, 
but vaccination project uh, process in Europe does not show much solidarity, I'm afraid. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Anastasia. Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia. Thank you for what you've shared with us and this uh, formula that you've uh, given us is uh, digital technology, the vaccine for the pandemic that will enable us to maintain contact with our works and our collections. So following on from these different uh, talks, which I found very complementary through the different perspectives of our speakers, I would uh, like to suggest that we can move on to some questions and answers. Perhaps some of the speakers might have some questions to ask one another, but also the different participants. Uh, there's 178 people in this meeting today. So uh, would any of the participants uh, like to raise their hands and ask a question? I'm just looking to see if there are any raised hands on the screen. I saw that we had uh, colleagues from the Museum of the Post Office. I wonder if they might have something to say to us um, off the cuff right now. Good afternoon. In terms of the Museum of the French Post Office, I think we can we can see the same kind of situation. We were fairly active during the first lockdown, lockdown and that worked really well with um, games and presence on social media, which were really uh, well supported. And um, then when the second lockdown was not the same thing, uh, we, uh, students were at school. School. So in terms of we had a quite a lot of um, podcasts that were targeted at children. So so that really worked really well during the first lockdown. So we kind of continued the, this approach, but less actively because we were falling back into something. We weren't we weren't any better prepared really because we we, we weren't expecting. The, the second lockdown, so we we didn't have time to put things in place, and the things that we did worked a bit less well. Um, but things that worked well was a kind of a, a conference that we did. We did a, a Teams conference um, with Francis Rocard on um, Man on Mar Mars. He's he's published um, some books, and he's well known on social media. And we had quite a lot of people there and that made it possible to record the the conference and we put it straight online uh, and that's that's working really well so this is something that was uh, very targeted and, and fairly technical but for a conference session of a couple of hours um, there are about 100 people there but we we deliberately limited it to 100 people which was a mistake because we could have had more people um, because uh, because if people cut uh, their, their their videos, um, audio takes virtually no bandwidth. So you can have uh, uh, an audience of 500 people who are just listening with without any problem, really. So Teams, which is is a is a is a is a group solution. We're we're all on the sort of. Microsoft. Uh, we use the Microsoft tools at, at, the, at the at the post office museum. Um, another thing that worked really well was the exhibition of of uh, of the universe. It opened in September. We had a real difficulty with this, so it it, it, it then it closed. Then uh, two months later, it wasn't just open for for two months. Um, and we we had the idea of making a film with artists um, talking about their work and explain their work because there are some pieces that that needed um, explanation from the artists. And this video, this this film, which lasts 20, about twenty minutes, um, was 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 sent around um, and pub published in. In, uh, 
in traditional media. I think it featured in Telerama, the, 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 the French TV magazine. But it what also worked really well is that when the exhibition closed and when it seemed like we weren't going to be able to see it again, we, we did an operation on social media to promote uh, this, um, which uh, it can be accessed via, via YouTube. And we've, we're, we're nearly at 5,000 um, views of this video, which is, doesn't have a particularly high technical level. It's, it's fairly, it's fairly user-friendly. It's true that if this was going to continue, we we have uh, an exhibition coming up um, on the, uh, around art, which is uh, focused a lot on on the art around stamps. It should it was planned for for March. It's going it's been pushed back to April. We're wondering about how we're going to make that work on, on the internet. Uh, we're looking for solutions. Uh, f for the moment, where everything is free, all of our digital resources are, are free. Uh, we're not planning for the moment to charge for it. Um, uh, the Louvre, they were very uh, active on um, on free guided tours. We're thinking about doing the same kind of thing. We're not really thinking about a, a, a model for payments. Uh, we're not really there, but we, we're thinking about it. Uh, I hope I haven't. I hope I've answered the question there. Um, yes, yeah, that's great. That's really, uh, really exactly what we're looking for. Um, uh, thank you for this. Uh, your additional comments. I saw that Paul Salman. I wanted to add something after what Anastasia said. So I'll just let you speak, Paul. Thank you very much. Yes, just, just very quickly. In a period where museums are are closed. It seems to me that uh, all of the offerings available on the internet and social media have a have a palliative role, which is really very useful. But I don't think that outside of these periods of closure, I don't think it's going to be an alternative to a physical tour. I just want to come back to a symposium organized at the end of 1992 at the Louvre, um, which was on uh, this sort of thing, but social media didn't exist. We couldn't yet do streaming of images. We could do sound. The question was whether uh, putting databases and collections online, um, whether that would uh, would affect physical tours. Uh, at the time, a number of thinkers thought about uh, future museums were going to be online and that physical museums had no future. Um, and, and I think they were totally, totally wrong, really, in that, because what's clear is that more there is documentation on online and accessible, more museums are being visited. I think it's that way that we need to see our digital offering. It's a kind of a prolongation of documents, of, of mediation tools, um, which which encourage physical visits. Uh, the works are not pictures. They have a texture. They have a volume. They can't be reduced to a to a screen, uh, a backlit uh, computer screen. So I think there's really no worry to have, no concern to have about uh, going online. I think we need to really see it this way. I think that's really very important. Of course, that's without talking about everything is to do about the act, the museum a museum activity which cannot be reduced just to collections of of contemporary uh, presentation thank you very much paul for this explanation i think claire um wanted to ask a question um with uh, um video conferences uh, supported by su uh, sponsors and wanted to know what technical resources will be available for small uh, museums. Please, Claire, do add anything in if there's something to add to that question. No, that's that's very good. Thank you very much. 
Could anybody answer that question, Pierre-Yves Lauchon? I don't know if you'd be able to answer that question. I don't know if Pierre Lauchon might have something to say, but I think in terms of images, we did a, uh, a kind of Facebook live event, and it was a, a, an event for payment. And we had a, a limited uh, number of people, just about 30 people who could who could all see each other and they could ask questions to the explainers. It was just a, a few euros, kind of a symbolic charge. Yes, I could just add to that. There are an increasing number of museums who are offering uh, this service. In terms of technical solutions to answer Claire's question, there are solutions. Like uh, Mr. Salmon has said, there are kind of general general tools like famous Facebook Live, which can do this kind of tour and can be monetized. You can also do it on Teams or on Zoom. There are also startups who have launched um, uh, ad hoc solutions. I'm thinking about the one that's used for the Louis Vuitton uh, Foundation, which I mentioned in my presentation, which is a, a mixture of, of uh, 360 degree video exploration and interaction with an explainer as part of a group of about 15, 12, 15 people. And there is other startups as well that offer this kind of solution. We have um, also uh, virtual tours uh, with screen sharing via Zoom or Teams. So in terms of technology, there's all kinds of uh, solutions that are currently available, are very easy to use and free in some cases. In other cases, there needs to be a, a partnership or uh, has to involve a, a service contract with companies. Actually, technology is not the problem today because there really are lots of solutions available. In terms of the question about uh, feedback uh, from museums, museums that have started uh, doing this by monetizing these tours, whether it's the City of Architecture in Paris or the Louis Vuitton uh, group, uh, they, they, they're seeing real success. All of their tours are full. Uh, so with the Sherman exhibition, for example, they've had to increase the number of uh, digital tours uh, for their exhibition, and they've had to um, prolong, uh, to extend uh, these the, the times for these exhibitions, even though officially it had been closed, and they had to negotiate with the artists so they could go beyond the physical exhibition. That was to answer um, a demand. In both cases, whether it's the City of Architecture or the Louis Vuitton institution, it was about five or six euros per person for the for the tour. So these are really very reasonable uh, prices um, for offering these uh, digital alternatives um, to physical visits. Thank you very much, both of you, for your answers. Yvon uh, Mateve also wanted to say something, so I'll let him speak. Yes, thank you. Be very quick. I work in the. I work with Brigitte La, La Boeuf. I just wanted to mention something that was really very important in a departmental regional mu museum. Something that's really fundamental for a number of institutions is the freedom that we have of communication ourselves. I'm not going to go into lots of detail here, but just to give an example. Um, we have some activities, like some people we have program activities, and we wanted to do a recording. We wanted to um, broadcast it, which took us quite a lot of time um, uh, on the on the website and on the museum Facebook um, page, and also the depart departments, um, the regional authorities, and then uh, these actions. Um, are, are excellent, but if we don't uh, raise awareness of new audiences to these new, this new activity, these new media, we don't see the result of the work that we put into it. It's really very important to communicate, to, to reach uh, other audiences. 
because even if the website museum has has a good number of visitors, we we um, these these the, 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 these experiences show us that we're really reaching um, people who are already connected with the museum, archaeologists, students. But if we 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 want to we don't really reach the family or local audiences who are used to coming to the museum. So I think it's really very important. All the energy that we do into producing this material, if we don't communicate about the new material, it's worthless, really. Thank you very much for that important point. I'm going to now just uh, present a question uh, from Cécile Dutte. Is solid uh, digital solidarity, is, it, is this not also the way that cultural institutions, museum, museums and libraries are coming to support readers, visitors and researchers, particularly by providing and uh, making available uh, as much as possible digital heritage and data from research? Is anybody that like to respond to that question? Perhaps just to say that the, one of the first things that I said to the person who's in charge of the, the website was to increase the size of, um, of, of file, the file size that we could put on the website so that students or, uh, or school children could use our images in their PowerPoints or if they needed to, to do that without any question of, of rights, because we have... Uh, we uh, have a very free uh, approach to non-commercial use of our images. But it's unusual that we have a satisfactory format for, for, our, for images, for image databases. Uh, often texts can be cut, we can cut and paste text, but for images sometimes it's more complicated. Cherki, would you like to add something? Yes. I'd like to just talk about another aspect that hasn't been mentioned during the, 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 the debate. Um, this is nothing is against the importance of digital technology, but what's really important is security. If you don't ensure that there is a, a, a digital security for your data, you risk making uh, information available to uh, ill-intentioned people who could use it to steal collections or or this kind of event. We have quite a few examples of this kind. Um, we had uh, the, the theft of a, a Van Gogh uh, painting, um, which was possible because the virtual tour made it possible to zoom on in the position of doors and cameras um, as part of the virtual tour. So if you have collections that are not secure, you mustn't put them online. We have an, another example in, in Yemen. They had to remove uh, one of the, the the plans from the brochure online because uh, one of the collections was stolen and the, the 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 burglar used the plan published on the website to get into the museum at night thank you very much for that alert i'm just going to keep going because we've got a lot of questions here which are really very very important um pierre if you just wanted to add something Yes, I just wanted to add to what Mr. Salmon has said about the, uh, the the making available images in a format that is more acceptable for for use. You were talking about use for research or academic use. I'd like to go perhaps a bit further and talk about open content strategies for, of some uh, French museums, French and other international museums, and say that the the success and the appetite for digital content during lockdown, the lockdowns was also expressed um, in terms of this open content resources, and particularly metropolitan and uh, open source resources who, who saw hundreds of thousands of images uh, made available in terms of open open content that have been available for a number of years and their, their use 
uh, really increased massively. There's no restriction in terms of their use, and this is a real booster for the use of these images and, and the broadcasting and the sharing of these images on social media. I was looking earlier on the Smithsonian Institute in America, and they're saying that in the fourth quarter of 2020, images, open content images, more than 14 million uh, open content images were downloaded, sorry, not downloaded, were viewed on the Smithsonian website, which is 30% up from the, the previous year. So the fact of making them freely available is a real booster for use of these, of these images. Thank you very much for these statistical uh, information. In terms of social media, we also have a question from Blondine. Um, some museums, do they use analytical data from their social media to adapt their offering and particularly develop more participatory uh, approaches? It's true that this aspect is really very interesting. Is there anything that anyone who would like to answer to this question? Brigitte? Brigitte Diabeuf, are you there? I don't really have an answer to this one. The museums that I've contacted uh, about their uh, visitor numbers and stats hadn't really got full information about that. This morning, I visited uh, a meeting called the Café du Deps, which was a meeting about uh, visitor numbers and visitors to museum websites. Site. One researcher who was uh, part of this organization previously from the, uh, the Directorate of uh, Museum Audiences, she said that her organization was going to start a study about the number of visits to websites and social media, carrying out both qualitative and quantitative research. And there's a working group that is currently working to build a survey that will be used in this study. So for the COVID periods, we haven't really got the, the data and the statistics necessary to answer that question. Would Antoine uh, Roland perhaps like to step in uh, and follow on from what Brigitte Liebeuf was saying? Perhaps I could uh, say something. I, I apologize for butting in like that. In terms of analytical data, what we're doing is that we're obviously studying what's working, what's not working, based on different uh, media channels. Uh, for example, if you compare Twitter and Facebook, the, the target audience is not at all the same. We can see that uh, when we post different uh, contents, uh, we can see the relative success on one platform or the other. But YouTube, again, is a, is a different audience uh, once again. In terms of participatory aspects, uh, asking uh, visitors about what we should do, what would be best for us to do, whether in terms of digital technologies or within uh, museums. Yes, that is something that we could do. We could say we're thinking about this future exhibition, uh, future temporary ex exhibition. What would you be most interested in, for example? Yeah, it could be possible. In terms of digital technologies, we are thinking about our museum scope. Uh, we say, okay, Athens Museum is doing this. We might benchmark ourselves against what's going on in other museums. And we work on the basis of what we think is most likely to attract uh, the general public. And we can perhaps use the analytical statistics on the social media to analyze whether it's good or not. In terms of the uh, museum's in situ offering, we, we don't work in this sense. We have a physical heritage, people are thinking in those terms. It's not the same question, really. So coming back up to the question about opening up the images, uh, that was a question that was raised earlier. It is only possible uh, if the museum owns its work. So uh, in the post office museum, uh, even 
the, the smallest uh, stamp might uh, be subject to copyright issues, the uh, uh, stamp design. Uh, uh, you know, not everything that we come come comes into our museum. We don't we don't always own the intellectual property, the copyright, the artist's rights. So you have to go back in time in order to be able to uh, use photos of, of works that are from the, the 19th century or things like that. Uh, otherwise, it can be very difficult. Our second floor in the museum uh, it's full of works of art, and we don't allow anyone to film in that area of the museum because we uh, were, know that we have to ask uh, for copyright for a, a limited period of time. It's, it, it's very tricky to organize. So uh, opening our overall picture database is something that we, we can't really envisage, and I think that's a position of many museums. We can't obviously prevent anyone from um, taking a photo with their smartphone and maybe posting it somewhere. But, but that's not really the way things should be working. That's, that's, that's what I wanted to say about the use of images. Okay, thank you, Eric. Let me share another question. This is from Anita. How can small museums be visible virtually? Uh, online without showing off their whole collection, but to encourage people to visit. Who would like to answer this question? The, Brigitte, Brigitte, would you like to um, say a little bit more uh, following on from what you've already said? Or perhaps Diana? Diana, if you can hear me. I could perhaps answer. Yes, thank you, Jackie. In terms of the small museum, there are a, a, a few possible solutions. You could, you could create a, a page on a social media platform, which is free. But the important thing is to provide support for the staff who are going to create the content and continue to feed it in. The tool is, is free of charge. Obviously, nothing is free in... in, in. Estelle says, I think we've lost Shaki. Yes, can, can, can you hear me? No, we can hear him. No, we can hear him well. I think it's my, my end that there's a problem. So in my opinion, if this uh, little museum is in just a small village or a small place, perhaps he could apply for a bit of funding from the, the local council or, or the town council. Or if it works uh, together with other museums in the local area, perhaps a richer museum might be able to uh, offer a a virtual platform that would enable it to to do this. The key thing, in my view, however, is to support the staff that will manage the content in order to ensure that everything is put in place well uh, and, and that the security of these small museums are not affected. Thank you very much, Shaki. Would anyone like to add something? I would like to just go back to this question about uh, online analytical data. We shouldn't uh, expect analytical data to do the work of uh, sociology of art or the work around sociology of the reception of museums. It tells us things about uh, geographical location, a type of connection used, where someone's from, but, it, but it's a very rough, very gross data. It, it can be useful, but it's very basic. However, there are some very useful online uh, questionnaire tools that you can uh, that you can use and can generate uh, really good data from. I'm not a specialist in it, but one of the members of our team here is good at using it, and we can get very fine grain uh, data from people who do agree to answer those questionnaires. Uh, Michel Rouget, I think... 
Michel Rouget, I think you wanted to say something. Perhaps a final uh, question or, or comment before we hand back to our president, our chair, for the final words. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to speak into this question about how can small museums uh, fit in with the use of uh, digital technology and social um, media. In our museum, in Parc Elysia, you need to be regular and you need to have very original, unique content. So you need to find your own style to be able to stand out and help uh, people uh, become interested in visiting. Digital technology is great, but the idea is to attract visitors to our site, of course. So find your own style and also be very regular in what you do. You can do that internally. Uh, I share what Pierre-Yves Lauchon said. I think uh, a lot of visitors enjoy the homemade type of content that are being done. Thank you, Michel. Thank you to those who have sent links to us uh, to give us extra information during the debate. So we've only got about four minutes left, and I would like to keep the time. So I do want to hand back to our chair. I want to thank everybody who has spoken today for the quality of what you've said. Thank you very much for keeping to time, which is very good. Uh, that doesn't always happen, and that's given a lot of opportunity for questions and answers. So thank you to all of the speakers, and thank you to all participants. Juliet, over to you to wrap up. Thank you very much, Estelle. Well done for your moderation. You've done very well. It was very lively and very stimulating. I've got lots of questions myself, but I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll have to come back to them uh, during our debate. I'd like to go back just a few minutes uh, to when Paul Salmoner was talking about the success of the debate with uh, Daniel Mendelssohn. You had a lot of people connecting to it. We had a very similar ex similar experience uh, on the 26th of November. We had a, uh, an evening debate on ethics. And we usually have 100 and 200 people. We had 400 connections, uh, uh, 400 at any one time, and 800 people connected in total. So I think that we are going to need to learn to uh, to work both in with the presence of, of people that we're all hoping for, but these new ways of working as well that, that these debates where, where it's so easy to take part, so easy to be, be part of something like that. And, and there was genuine debate. At the start, we thought in, in, in May, when we first started to, to network together, we thought it would be a bit of a, a palliative. Someone used that word earlier on, but we are seeing that it's not a palliative. Uh, in the debates and discussions, these are tools which can be genuinely useful. It can bring together a lot of people. 28 different nationalities took place in our uh, debate. We, you never have 28 nationalities coming to a physical event in Paris. So these types of events will need to tie in. There may, might need to be some cross-fertilization, as people used to say, uh, between the different uh, ways of working. I find that very exciting. There were some subjects we could have talked about uh, uh, which we may have just lightly touched on. We, we talked a bit about uh, social media and asked questions. Are social media uh, tools that support solidarity or not? That's a, that's a real question we could ask. Um, in some ways, they are, because we can communicate together. But we all know that they can also promote the opposite of uh, solidarity. Uh, as we've seen, for example, in American politics, uh, we've seen examples, for example, as such as cancel culture, uh, and we need to learn how to use these technologies. There's a whole field of new skills that we need to acquire, and I think it's a very exciting time to be in. We need to learn together how to use this. Our Greek friends were saying uh, that... Uh, their, their museums seem to find it more difficult to put in place digital tools in a meaningful way. And I think we need to work together to be able to help one another. Uh, that was perhaps my final word of conclusion. We've not talked a lot about remote working and the way in which digital technology has come into our world of work uh, in a transformatory manner. There's a lot more we could talk about together. 
But before we uh, close, I just want to give you a few dates, actually. Our next uh, session in this cycle of discussions on solidarity will be held on the 16th of March. Uh, it's the third Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Paris time. It's going to be about the uh, social uh, economy and solidarity between museums. So we're going to talk about different uh, types of uh, words that have been used to describe solidarity. So note that date, and then there will be the 20th of April, our professional network uh, tool for you, uh, solidarity. If you don't want to wait for the 16th of March, on the 9th of March, we're going to have another uh, longer discussion on ethics, which we're organizing with the IMP, and it's going to focus on a particular uh, subject. Uh, all of our international friends are very welcome, our Greek, Belgian friends, uh, uh, very welcome to join us. The question will be about research and museums. It's, and the question, is there a museum science? There's going to be a, a panel discussion. Uh, it's going to be on the Icon France uh, site, so it'll be a very interesting discussion. A further date that I wanted to give you is uh, to mention that last last Friday we had a meeting at the Ministry of uh, Culture, and we were asking about the possibility for opening museums. Just prior to that, we uh, started a we sent out a questionnaire to our partners and our European counterparts to ask about where people are at in terms of preparing for reopening. Uh, we were asking our European colleagues about where things are at in terms of uh, museum closings and reopenings. Look out on the Icon France site because we're going to publish the summary of the 97 responses we had to our questionnaire from our uh, French colleagues and the responses from our 26 European committees who uh, who answered. Uh, their different protocols can be posted online and they might be interesting for you to, to, to read. There'll be quite an intense level of uh, activity, perhaps even more intense than ever, because there, we've got Zoom conferences going on every month, these uh, different evening debates with 400, 500 uh, people. All of the, all of this period will uh, will remain for all of us a, a strange, unusual period, a, a period in which uh, we've needed to be creative in terms of the life of our museums. Thank you to all of you for taking part. Thank you for your talks, which have been very uh, interesting and relevant. Everything has been recorded, as you know. So you'll be able to uh, find it on our YouTube uh, uh, Paul Salmona uh, has given me the correct French translation of cancel culture. Uh, thank you, Tim, for that. And thank you to all of the participants. Let me just uh, thank Estelle for your wonderful moderation. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Goodbye.